right, and welcome yeah. back uh, to the show. Um, I know usually here we talk about talk to you know comic book creators about their work, but uh, today um, a little something different. Um, about a month ago, or a couple months ago, my wife got me an Audible subscription, and I was just kind of looking for books to read, and I came across uh, this one because as, as much as I like to read comics, I also like to read the history aspect of it, and particularly around the comics code and all that, and so much so that I, uh, at one point, broke down and bought a uh, library copy of Seduction of the Innocent, which um, I suggest if you want to read it, read it with a stiff drink. But uh, the book was uh, that I found on Audible was The Tencent Plague, uh, the comic book scare and how it, uh, and how it uh, changed America. And joining me today is the author of that book. I'll let him introduce himself because I will probably screw up his name. Um, but <laughs> how's it going? <laughs> uh, the name the name is pronounced Heydu. Okay, is, I would have screwed it up. You could say Heydu, which is actually correct in Hungarian. My family says it wrong. So either way, either way is fine. You can say it right, or the way that my I, or the way that I say it. Um, and uh, introduce myself. Well, I'm the author of the proud author of the Ten Cent Plague, which is a book I worked on for many years and conducted hundreds of interviews to do. And I'm thrilled to be here and have an opportunity to, to talk about it with you, as well as several other books in cultural history involving uh, music, mostly jazz, film, other uh, and comics and other aspects of culture. And I've written one novel and a book of graphic nonfiction, not a graphic novel, but a book of graphic nonfiction, which is the last thing I had published. Now you're seeing me in my uh, very bookish, it's not a prop, this is not a blue screen, this is my actual <laughs> office here at Columbia University, where you know, I'm proud to be a professor in the journalism school. I teach mm -hmm. a seminar in arts and culture for, uh, I'm going to try to move this screen a little bit. A seminar on arts and culture for not quite mid-career journalists, but established journalists who want to write with more authority on the art, arts. And that's what I teach. I'm also a critic, um, the music critic for the nation. And for the nation, I sometimes write about graphic novels and comics. You can see in the, I think in the bookcase behind me, I can move it's quite a bit of comics there and a whole lot more at home to my wife's deep pleasure. Same here. <laughs> so um, before we get started talking about the book, uh, do you remember maybe the first comic book that you picked up or? Yeah, yeah, I do. <clears throat> I was lucky that I had an older brother. I had a, a brother who was nine years older than me, who was a comics uh, nut. So I'm a, I'm a product of the Silver Age. So my, my brother's nine years older. It's a significant gap in age. So he actually had, he had the showcase with the Silver Age, introducing the, the Silver Age Flash. And he had the first Green Silver Age Green Lantern and the first Silver Age Flash and the original Justice League, the Silver Age Justice, well, actually the original Justice League. So he had all that. And so... Uh, those were the first comics I read. I read his. You know, in those days, most people didn't read comics to collect them. It's important to, rem to remember. They, you know, they read, the, bought them to, to read them. And then they would pass them on to somebody else and pass them on to somebody else and, and keep passing them on until they, fe they fell apart. They would literally fall apart. Uh, and then I was gravitated to D.C. because of my brother. I could tell a... Uh, a mildly entertaining an anecdote about this. <clears throat> I did a reading about the Ten Cent Plague at, the, at a Barnes and Noble in New York, and uh, there was a Q and A after it, and I was asked a question about Spider Man, and uh, I said, "Oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I can't answer. I really don't read Spider Man." And there was like an audible gasp in the room. <laughs> Like I had said, oh no, you know, I'm a, I'm a, pe I'm a pedophile. I'm a baby killer. You know, I said the worst possible thing. And my son said to me afterward, "Boy, Dad, you really blew it with that Spider-Man question." 
I said, why? He said, well, Dad, who's Clark Kent's double in the bottled city of Candor? I said, Valdon. He said, he said, well, you gave them the impression you don't read comics by saying you don't read Spider-Man. So I could have made clear that I was a, a, a DC brand. And in those days, you just kind of had to choose. Not so much, certainly not really the case at all anymore, but you were a DC person or a Marvel person or maybe a, an Archie person or a Dell person. <laughs> you know. uh, yeah, my older brother was the Marvel, and I gravitated more towards the DC um, so I get you. <laughs> it's really, it's not to say that one came up through one or the other. It's not really to express any value judgment. It's more like the kind of church you were raised in. You know, it's like <laughs> you were kind of groomed in this tradition. And it after a while, then you find your own way. And I did. I found my own way. And I gravitated to Daredevil very early. And then I discovered Marvel. And, you know, not, but I still am not a spider, sp spidey guy. I'm sorry. But, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I, I, I gravitated to, to, to Marvel in time. Uh, that was a strange time to be a comics fan uh, the, because the, Batman was just, just gotten ridiculous. Uh, and there was a lot of silliness in the DC universe in those days. You know, Super Horse and Super Monkey and <laughs> 32 different colors of kryptonite, all of which had a, a weird, a different effect. And, I talked about this with Michael Chabon, and, my, and he's he loves that period, and he loves that kookiness of it, that mm -hmm. juvenile. And I, I could appreciate it too, but it the the, the DC didn't have the, the the meat and the gravitas and the substance that Marvel was gravitating toward already, and that comics would would take another ten years to have in full bloom, uh, and that they had prior to that in the period that I wrote about in the 10 cent plague in the late 1940s and the early 1950s columns were comics uh, were fully were really quite sophisticated, you know, and then they got thrown back into the dark ages after the, cl uh, the clamp down on comics and the, the hysteria over comics. That's the main subject of my book. Mm -hmm. uh, so, nope. so, what inspired you to write about this period in the in, in comic book history? I mean, I mean, it's one of the most exciting ones. I mean, <laughs> yeah, right. It's 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 a fascinating story. It's a story that had been told in part, but only in small part. There's an enormous amount of that history that was still unknown when I started working on it, which is now I don't know fifteen. I put a lot. I put many many years in the book, so I think I started it. 15, 20 years ago, and I, and I worked on it for a long time. Uh, but it was still a largely unknown story. Uh, but because of the timing of the, the timing allowed me to have access to surviving witnesses of the events. So there's a window. I thought, well, if I do this book now, uh, there's still 40 or 50 living artists from the, from the first days of comics. You know, from the original, the first, the original comics, comic book artists from the mid 1930s were still surviving in significant numbers. And this, and these survivors were, were still lucid in many cases. So I could, I, I realized I could, by finding the witnesses of the events and talking to them and interviewing them, I could construct a fuller, truer picture of this story than had it been told. And then I found that there were aspects of it that really hadn't been reported at all that I was able to, let me give you an example of that. There was, you know, there were some references and histories of comics to his, the hysteria around comics, that mostly focused on Wortham. But in the course of that, missed the early history of the, criticism of comics. It started really with comic strips before comic books. Missed the role of the Catholic 
church and educational institutions and PTAs and the American Legion had in the anti-comics crusade, enormously significant, big parts of the story that were kind of lost in the focus on the bad guy, the focus on the focus on the villain of, of Wortham. Uh, I found a reference in the New York Times, a short article like this in the New York Times to there being some protests against comics and some students burnt comics in Binghamton, New York. So I went to Binghamton, New York and uh, took a bus, went to the local library. They had copies of, uh, of uh, the local papers. And I found the names of some of the, the, the students who had participated in, in a, this burning. I was, it, I realized, well, it, it's possible they're still alive and it's possible they're still living in the area. So I just, you know, called people with the same name and I started finding these kids who, who dragged their wagons around the neighborhood and collected comics and threw them into a bonfire and, you know, and marched around the bonfire reciting incantations. And I found these kids now as 70, 80 year old people. One of them, Vince Hawley said, I, I interviewed him. He said, Oh, David, I still have my yearbook. He said, he said you, you, I don't really have any use for this anymore. You, you, you take this, you can have this. He said, are you kidding? No, 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 you take this. So I take the yearbook. Now, this photo is now all over the web, but it's all over the web because I scanned it and it's in my book. But this is where it originally appeared. And it's in this yearbook that is a celebration of these kids burning their comic books. It's all over the oh, web. Wow. <laughs> On this now, it's all over. You read the audio book, so you missed the pictures in the book. Yeah, I did. <laughs> 2,000 comic books go up in flames as St. Patrick's pupils sing Catholic youth rally songs. And there's a, there's a, a list of, there's a caption with these kids' ID. So I started calling them. And then I found more, and I found more. And then I was able to find events like this all over the country, uh, Illinois, uh, uh, Wisconsin, upstate uh, New York, Florida, Colorado, literally all over the country. You know, young kids were burning books. In one case, during the Second World War, 1945. So we're still fighting the Nazis, the, the book burning Nazis, and we're doing it at home. Yeah. Is, so why did I write the book? Because so much of it was still an untold story, an unknown story that I wanted to tell. And I felt very lucky to be able to tell it. Now, throughout your you know research and putting the book together, was there something that you learned that, you know, just surprised you or, you know, moved you in you know a certain way yeah 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 there was a big thing i learned that actually became one of the themes of the book that wasn't part of the book in my proposal to my publisher uh and that wasn't that didn't inform my original thinking which was how diverse the community of early comic book artists were how many women there were who were making yeah. drawing comics like i was stunned because they were kind of lost to history, as well as members of you know ethnic and racial minorities. Uh, uh, Fred Keita, uh, uh, ja Japanese, other Japanese artists, uh, African American artists, Matt Baker, and and others, and others. Matt Baker is like one of the greatest comic comics artists in the history of the form. You know, African American, M much more diverse community, and I didn't realize <clears throat> how to the degree to which those early comics artists gravitated to comics because they loved it, but because they had nowhere else to turn. Because they were, they were, they were poor, perhaps. They were members of ethnic minorities that weren't accepted in the world of magazine illustration or commercial art, or because they had a sensibility 
a way of seeing the world and a way of rendering it in visual form that was too radical and too weird for for the mainstream consumption in mainstream publications. So I, I didn't realize I didn't realize that. I heard various versions of stories of people probably 20 or 30 versions of stories of young artists knocking on doors with their portfolio and being sent away for because they were because they were Jewish seriously or because they were Italians you know seriously uh, or because they're members of, of, of minorities or because the work was too oh, too cartoony cartoony mm -hmm. There's a terrible bias just against the form of comics. Just, you know, but it, it was not taken, it was not taken as a sign of talent to work in the form of comics well. Will Eisner told me about going, uh, I got to know, very fortunate to get to know Will very well. I have some things actually that are on the other side of my office that he drew for me. I can show you, but I have to get up and come back. <laughs> okay. That um, that when he was looking, he was older than many of the people I had interviewed and very early comics artists, and said that when he was looking in the one ads for ads for illustrations, the ads at, the, at that day would say uh, the Christian Company. It would be actually advertised in the basically the no Jews allowed mm -hmm. or, or terms like uh, elite or restricted. They'd use code language. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that, that was a big surprise to me. Uh, the number of women uh, and the number of minorities and, the, and, and how dearly early comics artists held comics because they felt this was a world where they were welcome and they treasured the fact that they were they were accepted and welcomed in this world where they were shut out more broadly. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, I know it's kind of a small part of the book, but uh, and again, you mentioned uh, Dr. Frederick Wortham. Um, and as I mentioned before, I, uh, I tried reading Seduction of the Innocent. <laughs> I tried. I bought a copy off eBay. <laughs> Maybe I threw it out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh it's it's disturbing. Yeah. Did 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 you for 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 your book, did you actually go through that book or Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a big believer in the Robert Caro approach to turn every page. You know, that's mm -hmm. his mantra. When you're doing yeah. research, turn every page. And I read uh, every page of Seduction of the Innocent and research what I could of his archives. Uh, the, ar the, the majority of his archives were still under lock and key at the Library of Congress. They've since been opened, uh, but I had a friendly curator down there who let me see some of it. Uh, but uh, you know, I researched, in the, you know, the time I was doing my research too, it, it was very early days of ProQuest. Like it's, I mean, 15 years ago, you have to, we really, it's hard to get your head around how, how radically, research itself has been transformed in the digital era and how quickly things have, how much things have changed in just the past 15 years because i was still going through in many cases from microfilm you know because a lot wasn't digitized you just couldn't like google the publication and have it pop up and of course comics themselves well now a great deal of comic comic now a great deal of all comics have been scanned and they're online mm -hmm. i started my research they're not so I'm, you know, going to uh, comic shops and thrift stores and everywhere I can find to find reading copies of comics. And I'm buying, yeah. you know, I'm buying the cheap ones that are falling apart where, the, you know, the, the cover is separate. And I've even bought piles of the of crime comics this way. This is the only way to, it was the only way at the time to get them. Uh, and... 
crime co uh, comics, romance comics, horror comics. There, there was a, there was no resource like like there is now. Yeah, to get them. But I did turn every page, and the Wortham book is disturbing. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember. Um, it was my for my uh, college English class I took in as a senior in high school. I did a turn paper on seduction of the innocent and it was impossible finding stuff <laughs> yeah going through going through trying to go through j store and <laughs> yeah it was luckily uh, you know i think at the time wizard comics at the time had done like a pretty good spread on the on it too so that was at least a jumping off point for me to try to do whatever research i had to do <laughs> right Right. I mean, he, he was a horrible person. His, his methods were reprehensible. He, he did do some good in terms of making mental health care available to the minority population in Harlem. Uh, it's the, he was a leader of the Lafargue Clinic, which still exists. Mm -hmm. uh, and that the value of that should not be diminished. It, it is, a, a, you know, a piece of his legacy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a piece like this of a legacy like this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I, I, so I, you know, it's important to see things in their, uh, in their totality. Right. It, it's too, e it's too easy just to, just to make him a, kind of an all purpose bad guy. He's, he was yeah. close to it. He's a pretty awful person. Uh, but there were there were others who came before Wortham, who I give quite a bit of attention to in, in my book, who latched on to comics for specious reasons, and you know, and demonized comics writers, comics artists, and the people who read them, meaning the young people who read them, back to the days of comic strips you know mm -hmm. a lot of the language that was critical of comic books beginning began before Wortham in the 1930s and it, it echoes the language of criticism of comic strips in the first two decades of the 20th century a lot of the same phrases come up uh, they're, uh, they're 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 uh, they're the, the big the big criticisms were uh, that they revel in the prurient, or they revel in uh, defiant behavior. I mean, they wouldn't yeah. say defiant behavior, you know, bad behavior. Yeah, as if, as if the depiction of that behavior is necessarily a glorification of it. You know, it's a real problem. So anyway, so do you see? You know any parallels between that period in the comic book comic book history and you know the industry today? Hmm. I know things are a lot, you know, more oh, you know, free to yeah. do whatever you want. Um, right. But th but there's but there's still you know the major companies still kind of tiptoe you know, along that line of, you know, what was kind of established, even though they don't use the code anymore. I mean, comics are such a commercial juggernaut. They absolutely dominate popular culture in a way that w was unthinkable in the time that I wrote about. And even unthinkable at the time that I was a kid, you know, there had, the, the I was, they, we had the Superman movies with, you know, with George Reeves, but they were an anomaly and a novelty. And, and it was exciting that there was a superhero uh, on screen, uh, but, you know, and co comics just didn't dominate, weren't central to the culture uh, in the way that they are, that they are now. Now, uh, and they're, they're fairly dark and, provocative and you know, and daring in their mainstream iteration. So I don't really think there's a lot of 
parallel today. There, I would expect there to be another art form that would that would come up that would be the target of the, the same kind of criticism. So for the parallel to be precise, it has to be something new and misunderstood. And there's something that appeals to kids that young people that adults don't understand. Mm -hmm. So for a while, video games were subjected to the same kind of criticism. But now everyone is, you know, everyone is 40 and who has kids grew up playing video games. My kid can beat Sonic and he's six years old. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So there, there may be, there's going to be some new form probably that mm -hmm. will be parallel. But I can't imagine what that was. I should mention that when I'm talking about comics being the dominating the popular culture today in a way that they didn't when I was young, it's, it's worth noting that the period I wrote about in the Ten Cent Plague was not the period of my own youth. It's the period of, you know, 30 years before my own youth in the, in the period from the 1930s up mm -hmm. into the mid-50s, well before I was born. I mean, decades before I was born. And in that time, comics did dominate the, pop, the culture. I mean, comics were, were the most popular form of entertainment in America. More, more people read comic books than watched movies, read magazines, or watched or, or read even read newspapers. Uh, so which is largely forgotten. And that's and that's just a a statistic for the I should have said more more people bought comics. And then each one of the comics that were bought were probably read by another twenty or thirty yeah. people. You know? <laughs> So, you know, comics really, and they crossed racial lines and they crossed lines of gender and they crossed lines of class. Like everybody read comics in, yeah. the, in the 30s and 40s and early 50s. All right. Well, I mean, uh, as we uh, wrap up here, um, is there anything else that maybe, you know, we didn't cover that you wanted to say about the book? I mean, it's been out since 2009, correct? Yeah. No, I, I'm going to plug my own graphic book while I have an audience because I didn't oh, graphic plug away. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, just won the Deems Taylor Award for uh, for writing on on music and popular culture. It's about an earlier period in American popular culture, the era of vaudeville, when there oh. were three transgressive artists. One, and it deals with issues of race uh, and and gender and sexuality and proto-feminism in an era 100 years before ours. So it's kind <laughs> of the story of the 21st century, but set in the early 20th century. So that's my plug. And thank you for having me on. This is really great. I really appreciate yeah. it. Um, again, I, I, as I said, I enjoyed the book. And uh, I mean, I, I will probably listen to it again. Uh, <laughs> I I just kind of picked it up on a whim. I was just kind of looking through the stuff, and I was like, "Oh, this this looks interesting. I'll give it a listen." And you know, I was I was pretty much hooked from the first you know couple minutes. <laughs> I've never heard the audio book, so I have no idea how it reads. Were you happy with it? I was, yes. Okay. I mean, maybe, I maybe I'll maybe I'll read my audio book now. <laughs> but uh. Are you, can, are you on uh, social media? Can people find you there? Uh, Instagram, go ahead and plug that too. <laughs> Instagram and Twitter, uh, David Hadu underscore, D A V I D H A J D U, close up underscore. And that's me. I don't like Facebook. I'm not on Facebook. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time this evening to talk about the book. And, um, you know, again, Thank you, and it was very interesting and a very informative listen or read. Well, that. Thank you very much. All right. Well, have a good evening, and uh, uh, we'll be in touch. Oh, thank you. Take care. Good night.